Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 74, August 15th to August 21st, 1862. Last week, we spent time in Virginia fighting the Battle of Cedar Mountain. Lee will soon be looking to force a more decisive battle with John Pope and his army of Virginia. We also talked about the massacre at Neuchus in Texas, as well as two battles in Missouri, continuing the fighting out there. This week, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We're going to first continue with some of the actions in Virginia and see what is going on there. Afterwards, we will spend the rest of the time in Minnesota and talk about the Dakota War or the Sioux Uprising. That story we will try to play out in its entirety. Before we do that, though, I do want to mention that we have new Patreon content. And this is a memoir review, uh, Fletcher's Rebel Private Front and Rear, and he is talking about the seven days as well as some of the other battles we'll see coming up pretty soon. Second Manassas is one of them. So if that sounds like something that interests you, the perspective of a rebel soldier having fought in the Texas Brigade and then Terry's Texas Rangers, we have posted that to the Patreon feed. That link is in the description. So your support for the show is greatly appreciated. Let's get started with the Old Dominion. So I do want to talk about what is going on in Virginia. When last we left off, Jackson had punched Pope's army in the mouth, victimizing Banks yet again. As a result, Banks will not be participating in the coming battle of Second Manassas. Union and Confederate forces would then be at a stalemate. Lee would have received the valuable intelligence that Burnside and McClellan were both withdrawing to join Pope. The Army of Northern Virginia would be ready to strike a blow. Reminiscent of the recent Seven Days battles, Lee would draw up a plan to flank and crush the Army of Virginia. It would include Stuart moving his cavalry to cut off the enemy to the north, holding a critical ford. Pope, on the other hand, was deciding the best move. It ultimately included retreat, especially after Cedar Mountain. Combine that with the fact that living off the country did not prove as fruitful as previously thought, and yes, there is a pun intended in there. Jesse Reno of Burnside's Corps had arrived, though, and reinforced Pope. Burnside, with the rest of his men, were sitting at nearby Fredericksburg. Lee's attack was delayed, Jackson wanting to push on the 18th. Longstreet's men had just arrived, and Anderson's were still around Richmond. This delay would prove critical. Stewart had sent Fitzhugh Lee north, but had not given him a timetable. Rather than speed to the location, his was taking a less than ideal route. Union cavalry would cross the Rapidan unmolested and actually almost capture Stuart. What they did capture was a staff officer who had orders of Lee outlining the plan of attack. Robert Toombs, who, if you recall, had acted rashly during the Peninsula Campaign, had withdrawn two of his regiments, ordered by Longstreet, to guard the ford that the Union cavalry used. Hope would be able to order a retreat, and Lee would be again denied a great victory. There's actually some pretty good accounts of Stuart very barely escaping Union cavalry. It's very dramatic, almost his staff and himself coming out onto the porch of a house that they're staying at, and then they see the cavalry coming up the road, and they think it's Fitzhugh Lee, but instead it's Union cavalry, so they all have to make a dash for horses and, and uh, run away under fire. Stuart is particularly upset because he loses 
a very nice hat. He's very well known for his flamboyant outfit, so he is not too happy, but as we will see, he is going to get some revenge here in a future episode. Now, if you remember, we talked a while back about the three-cornered war in the Southwest. This was called as such because of a situation where you had the Union, Confederates, and Native tribes all at war with one another. I do want to take some time to mention, and hopefully this will be something you did not know, that just because the war was going on, it does not mean there was an end of hostilities on the frontier. In 1862, there would occur what is known as the Great Sioux Uprising. Now, the Sioux have already made an appearance in our narrative, showing up during the Black Hawk War in 1832. Remember, they were particularly zealous in the eliminating of Black Hawk's band, because those were some rival tribes. While made up of several different groups of people, the Lakota Sioux are probably the most well-known. They would be what we picture when thinking about life on the plains. Well, as you may have surmised by their proximity to Illinois, there was a vast part of the northern United States that they covered, including modern-day Minnesota. One thing that has been pointed out to me in a variety of my source material is that what we probably consider to be the frontier was probably not the case back in the times of the Civil War. Parts of the South had a more Wild West vibe. Minnesota and Wisconsin we don't think of as fitting that description, but they very much were. We should mention that Minnesota, now a state, had a growing capital at St. Paul, and the reservations were only a two-day journey away. Already, there had been enthusiasm with volunteers joining up to defend the Union, notably the first Minnesota being present at First Bull Run. There were many immigrants from German and Scandinavian countries who would be eager to support the cause. This outpouring of manpower, while good for the Union and the federal government, would actually pose a potential issue. Furthermore, Minnesota is not the Great Plains, with grasslands and woodland. It was here that lived a part of the Sioux, the Eastern Sioux, or the Santee. These people had been compromising via treaties with the federal government. Many had started to wear clothing and build dwellings more closely resembling the settlers that had moved into the state. Part of this compromise was living on reservation land and receiving an annuity payment from the government so that they could purchase goods and supplies from the settlers. Without this money, there was friction between those providing the supplies and the natives who were hungry. They would be less and less likely to extend lines of credit with a delay in the payments. But why were the payments delayed? Well, there is a war going on, and that is obviously very expensive. So, an annuity payment to the Dakota would probably go unnoticed. Something we mentioned when talking about Andrew Jackson way back when was the spoil system, where an incoming party would reward their supporters with government positions. Indian agent was one such position, and it did not matter whether the individual was qualified or whether they would be a good fit in that role. Oftentimes, this would result in corruption and less of an emphasis on giving out the money as there was in lining one's own pocket. So we see there are a lot of different factors. There's an outgoing of manpower, so there's not as many individuals who are of fighting age who can defend the local communities. There's a lack of food, also a lack of money, and there are individuals who are otherwise potentially unqualified 
to be the ones who will quell any kind of bad blood. Little Crow, who was called by many names, was a key voice amongst the Eastern Sioux. At 52, he had been around the block and done his best to try to assimilate into the new culture, even living in a more westernized dwelling. He had seen other groups receive this crucial payment, but yet his own people were hungry. Cutworm had destroyed crops, leading to a dependence on the goods that were supplied, and an even further dependence on the annuity given to them by the government so that they could buy those goods. The agents would not believe that the situation was so severe. Already, there had been a threat of violence, but never any action. A group of warriors would go hunting in August, finding nothing, they would attempt to barter with a settler family for food. This would lead to a misunderstanding at the potential theft of some eggs, and there would be violence that resulted in the deaths of the settler's family. Alcohol was most likely involved in this scenario. To Little Crow, it would seem that the writing was on the wall. The choice was now either fight or wait for harsh reprisal. Realizing that the choice really was more in the camp of fighting rather than potentially continuing to try to make peace, Little Crow was a reluctant war leader, reportedly covering his face with ashes as a sign of mourning. He knew all too well that white settlers cared very little for the different tribes. To them, all Indians were hostile and all were the same. Violence erupted all over the area that was known as the Lower Reservation, with men, women, and children being killed by roving bands of Dakota warriors. Eastern Sioux would flock to Little Crow's village, his dwelling the headquarters for the native operations. Those who provided supplies were obviously the first targets. One such agent was found riddled with arrows and bullets. Apparently, he had been quoted as having said the Sioux could eat grass for all he cared. When his body was found, grass was found stuffed in the mouth of his corpse. Violence did not end with these agents. Warriors would often ask for food from settlers before murdering all in the house. Panic would set in all throughout the region, with settlers heading for the safety of Fort Ridgely. Rumors of casualties amongst the civilian population would spread quickly to St. Paul. Tales of these actions that were obviously motivated by frustration and hatred did very little to dissuade a vision of the Dakota having a truly savage culture. For the killings, alcohol was often involved, with usual mercy suspended. I have seen that there is definitely a change in worldview here that may have disadvantaged the settlers. Their more peaceful and docile nature, when compared with a more harsh warrior culture, was seen as weakness. This might have made the Dakota much more angry. Soldiers from Fort Ridgely attempted to respond to the raids, but they did little, having the commanding officer die crossing a river. Lieutenant Timothy Sheehan would take over in the defense of the area, although manpower was short. Reinforcements would be on the way, many of the men who were slated to join the Union Army being rerouted and kept in the state. Panic had reached all the way to Chicago in the meantime. Those captured during the raids were taken to the village of Little Crow to await their fate. In the meantime, there was an attempt to attack the remaining garrison at Fort Ridgely. Ridgely was an open fort with no palisades or walls, but the Dakota were not organized in their attacks. It devolved into a series of smaller-scale firefights 
with a handful of casualties on both sides. Despite having as many as 800 warriors attacking the open fort, the soldiers did have artillery, which they used to discourage mass attacks by the Dakota. Meanwhile, there was also an attack at the nearby town of New Ulm. New Ulm was founded and populated by German immigrants. These particular immigrants were actually of an anti-religious sect and had moved into Minnesota being a particular target for know-nothings in Chicago. Dakotas had two unsuccessful assaults on the city, but many buildings were burned in the process. Fighting was house to house and street to street. Although desperate, there was little to show for the struggle. Little Crow would step away from the first couple of days of the war with many captives, but not a whole lot to show for his efforts. Groups of Dakota continued to raid, and Little Crow's band was dwindling in numbers. There were some of the Eastern Sioux who did not want to fight and referred to the battle as Little Crow's War. Ho-Chunks and Winnebago's declined to join the war as well. Ojibwe, or Chippewa, who were usually the enemies of the Dakota, would likewise decline. They would, however, use the situation as leverage against the federal government. Obviously, this was a kind of, you know, it would be a shame if the same thing that's going on in the lower reservation happened with the Ojibwe here. So as a result, they were able to come out with more favorable terms. The Dakota, though, would be alone in their efforts. Federal response was finally getting organized. Leading the men was someone who was very familiar with the Sioux, Henry Hastings Sibley. Sibley was a former fur trader, having been born in Detroit. He had spent much time in Minnesota and most likely knew Little Crow from when they were younger men. Sibley would gather some 1,600 men who could bear arms from a variety of sources. Recruits for the war, home guard, civilians, it did not matter. Sibley did avoid disaster at the Battle of Birch Coulee. This would involve a Sioux ambush on a burial detail, which included a company of the 6th Minnesota commanded by Hiram Grant. These men had been captured by Forrest during his Murfreesboro raid and paroled. Some in the press would decry their usage after having been paroled, but this was not against the Confederate Army. Sibley was able to march to the aid of the besieged camp, but the soldiers had suffered some 60 casualties at the cost of only two warriors killed. Sibley would reach out to his former friend Little Crow, who pins, as a result, the reasoning for the killings and the uprisings in general. Dear sir, for what reason we have commenced this war, I will tell you. It is on account of Major Gilbreth. We made a treaty with the government and begged for what we do get, and can't get that till our children are dying with hunger. It is the traitors who commenced it. Mr. A.J. Myrick told the Indians that they would eat grass or dirt. Then Mr. Forbes told the Lower Sioux that they were no men. Then Roberts was working with his friends to defraud us out of our monies. If the young braves have pushed the white men, I have done this myself. So I want you to let Governor Ramsey know this. I have a great many prisoners, women and children. It ain't all our fault. The Winnebago's were in the engagement, and two of them were killed. I want you to give me an answer by the bearer. All at present, yours truly, Little Crow. This particular letter is very insightful. Obviously, he names a lot of these agents who had done the Dakota wrong. And particularly interesting is the line, it ain't all our fault. I think if we take a look at that, it really shows that there is at least a little bit of remorse in terms of 
what's been happening with these raids and that it's not entirely on the supposed savage culture, at least how they're being portrayed in the media in places like St. Paul. So it's an interesting insight from Little Crow writing in his own words. Sibley would move his force forward and meet the Dakota in a battle at Wood Lake on September 23rd, 1862. Foragers from his expedition would run into Dakota warriors laying in wait. The tactic was to draw these men further out so they could be hit in the flanks, but Sibley would recognize this and pull his men back to his camp, which was a stronger defensive position. From there, the U.S. troops would exchange fire with their enemy. A flanking attempt was foiled by the use of artillery. Soldiers would also conduct a successful bayonet charge, clearing the way of the attacking Dakota, who would then withdraw. Many of the Dakota who were present fired their weapons into the empty air, having been coerced into fighting. They were gearing up for any kind of reprisal by the U.S. government. The army suffered 7 killed and around 30 wounded, with 13 dead Dakota left on the battlefield. Sibley would refuse to allow a collection of the dead, instead insisting they would be buried according to the white customs. After Woodlake, Little Crow would realize the futility of continuing the fight. Friendly Dakotas had taken charge over the white captives and had fortified their camp, ready for a potential reprisal raid by the hostiles. No more violence would occur, and Sibley's men would successfully occupy the camp without incident, freeing the captives. What happened afterwards probably could have been another podcast in and of itself, but we will try our best to iron out the details. Sibley would set up trials via the military to determine if any of the Dakotas were guilty of the crimes against civilians. In a weird callback, Winfield Scott had actually set the precedent for these proceedings in the war with Mexico. Remember that Scott had dealt both with atrocities committed by the American troops, especially the volunteers, and then he was also dealing with Mexican guerrilla forces or irregular warfare, so he needed to come up with a way in which he could try potentially guilty individuals. John Pope, who had arrived from the East, would demand swift and extreme action. Maybe some 730 civilians were dead, and as many as around 92 soldiers at this point. Throughout the process, some of those deemed friendly were actually found guilty. Here is the problem with the whole situation. John Pope gets to Minnesota, and he really has nothing to do. If you go from potentially saving the Union and winning the war to a crisis at West, but the crisis is actually resolved, then it's kind of hurtful to the ego. As a result, Pope would wish to begin the immediate executions of those found guilty. These trials were sometimes rushed, and there were translation issues. Many times, the Dakota were confused about the verdict, not knowing if they were guilty or innocent, and not understanding the evidence that was found against them. What constituted guilty would also expand to firing weapons or joining parties moving out to fight. By November, some 303 had been found guilty. President Lincoln would have a tough choice to make, since he was the one who would sign off on the death sentence. On the one hand, there were many civilians who had been killed, and those in Minnesota were demanding that there be some kind of retribution. Remember that there are some political concerns among the Lincoln administration. If he doesn't make the right choice here, he might lose Minnesota to the Democratic cause. But on the other hand, the Dakota relations were not stabilized. Little Crow still had maybe a hundred or so warriors and was operating in the state. If the friendly Dakota were to turn and join Little Crow 
after a large-scale execution, then it could prove problematic. Too lenient, then the citizens in Minnesota would not be happy. With the 1864 election down the road, this could be a crucial turning point. Mobs had been formed in several places wishing for violence against the condemned Dakota. Sibley, amongst other army officers, would threaten to disperse the mobs by force if they did not go peacefully. There were rumblings that groups of men were forming to take matters into their own hands if unwelcome news arrived regarding the prisoners. No, there had to be middle ground. Lincoln sought legal guidance. Could he pardon some, but not others? Of course he could. But he would need to single out who was to receive a lighter sentence and who would have their sentence of execution upheld. The president would create a commission to review the cases and the testimonies. They would limit their numbers to those who had been proved to have committed crimes against civilians. Eventually, 39 Dakota names were listed in front of the president, and as 1862 drew to a close, he would sign off on their executions. On December 25, 1862, 38 of the Dakotas were executed by hanging. This would actually be the largest mass execution in American history. When told of the sentence, the condemned were mostly cool in their reaction. Some would give statements detailing the unfair nature of their trial. While the bodies were placed in a mass grave, the burial site was robbed. One body, that of Cutnose, a particularly fierce warrior, was taken by one William Mayo for medical purposes. Mayo would start a practice that would become the foundation of the Mayo Clinic, continued by his sons, William and Charles. The boys would learn the human body via the skeleton of Cutnose, acquired after the execution. Sibley would continue to campaign against the Dakota. I might talk about some of these in a later episode. Eventually, Little Crow would be killed by a civilian while harvesting berries. Amazingly, despite being on the run, this would actually be very close to where the uprising began. His body would be displayed. Skull finally returned to his family in 1970. John Pope would actually become a very big advocate for the other Dakotas who had been formally condemned. They would be pardoned by Andrew Johnson and sent to a reservation. The Dakota War would be significant to the further development of Minnesota. It would also be a contributing factor to the future violent relations with the Lakota leading to the wars in the 1870s. This would see famous figures like Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse participate. Let's draw things to a close there. This week, we went over the Dakota War. Next week, we need to set up the events that will lead us once again to Manassas. We will be pretty action-packed for a few episodes, so sit tight. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show would be greatly appreciated. Once again, feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, concerns, the email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week.